Oh, we know that our financial health is so intimately tied to our psychological health, and there's so many emotions that surround money for us. Um, guilt, shame, fear, um, anger, and we know that it has a huge impact on so many levels of our life. Just think about times in your life if you've ever been financially stressed, you have trouble sleeping, um, your appetite is upside down, you feel lethargic, tired. I mean, it affects so much of us. And we can impact our mood by our behavior. So, you know, often people will say, well, I'm going to wait until I feel better, until I do those things. Uh-uh. What you got to do is do the things that you do when you feel good, and your mood will change as a side effect of that. Yeah, well, I do a number of things. I've got one of the things that I do that people most commonly associate with psychologists is I maintain a private practice. So I, so I see patients at a medical clinic. Yep. Um, I see adults and couples provide treatment, and the most common psychological health problems are depression and anxiety and couples treatment and workplace stress. Um, and workplace stress is actually an area that I specialize in. So I do a lot of organizational consulting. So working with companies and organizations and teaching them how to create psychologically healthy workplaces. Because stress is it something to look forward to, something hopeful. Finally, spring weather is coming. We get excited and then we get a little let down. So that means rather than saying, you know, I'm going to never eat junk food, I'm going to work out five times a week for the whole year, who's going to stick to that, right? Way better to say, I'm going to work out three times a week at six o'clock, you know, at the gym that's around the corner from my place for the month of January. And write it down. It's amazing the power of writing things down psychologically for us makes a huge difference. For example, someone who maybe hasn't worked out for 10 years will say, my resolution is to work out five days a week. And that's not going to happen, right? If you haven't done it at all for years to set this unrealistic goal, of course you're setting yourself up to fail. I mean, first of all, I, I think usually that comes from people that are being well-meaning, mm -hmm. right? And, and I do think fundamentally we are social creatures and all of us thrive off social connection and that looks a lot of different ways. It can be through friends and family, um, you know, through coworkers and colleagues, things that we do, but certainly love is a core part of that for a lot of us. I think when family or friends are trying to, you know, do the hookup or, you know, don't be so picky and those kinds of things, unfortunately it puts this kind of pressure and makes people feel worse at times. Right. Time in every culture, every community has superstitions and, and there's a number that are actually very, very universal and a superstition really is a belief or a practice that we hold when we're faced with something that we can't otherwise explain, right? And they often have to do with things like warding off illness, warding off evil, being able to prevent accidents, right? Things that we might not have control over. Um, as humans, it's really important for us to be able to get some semblance of control over circumstances in our life. So what makes Friday the 13th such an unlucky day? Well, you look at kind of historically the sixth day of the week has kind of historically been seen as this ominous day and the number 13 has been associated with bad luck. And it's, I actually look this up to try and say, like, where did this number come from? And primitive man had, well, has 10 fingers two feet and the idea was that there's 12 units that you can use to count and that the primitive men couldn't count beyond 12 and that anything past that number 13 on, on and onwards was something that was unknown and beyond oh, what we could okay. comprehend. So, yeah. Well, the concept for the show is we took a community, Alder Grove, BC, and mm -hmm. took a hundred families in that community and right. worked with them over the course of 10 weeks to see if they could collectively increase their net worth by one million dollars. Yeah, well, one of the things that you're touching on, so, so finances and sex, the two most difficult things for people to talk about, right? right? And, and I'll see, I have a private practice as well, and, and individuals that'll come in that have been been, you know, married 10, 20, 30 years, may have two or three kids and, and share all of these elements in their life, yet can't talk about money, right? And there's so much um, emotionally that's tied to our relationship with money. And for most people, like the principles are simple, right? Um, earn more, um, spend less, save more, right? And then you think, well, why do so many Canadians struggle with financial issues? Mm -hmm. And it's because of all of the other kind of emotional stuff. Um, for all of us, a big part of our relationship with money comes from what we've seen in our families growing up, right? How money was talked about, what it was used for, um, what um, kind of end it was seen as a means toward. Mm -hmm. I thought I loved my pets. That is a scene from Confessions Animal Hoarding, a new series that's out. And Dr. Jody Samra, a clinical psychologist here in Vancouver and the president of the BC Psychological Association, uh, as you saw, was in that particular episode. And uh, 
serves as an expert and consultant on the show as well. Thanks for coming in this morning. Yeah, thank you for having me. So, so certainly we've seen a lot of attention given to the whole issue of hoarding. And, and what we're normally used to kind of, or more familiar with seeing is what's called object hoarding. So right. when people are collecting things, mm -hmm. but we know a subset of hoarders um, gravitate mostly toward animals. Um, and you're right, the kind of the cat lady is the yeah, stereotype. The the World Health Organization estimates that by the year 2020, depression will be the second leading cause of worldwide disability, second only to cardiac health issues. Wow. And awesome. I'll let you know when I can talk so, about it. So, uh, wait a second. You're practicing uh, as a psychologist. Uh, you're doing this show, and of course, you have speaking engagements all over the time. Uh, how much are you sleeping? <laughs> uh, not much. Not enough. <laughs> That's why I'm losing my voice. Yeah. I know. I don't have a very psychologically healthy workplace. <laughs> Myself, I say my boss is kind of a you know what. No, yeah. Mike, <laughs> your your boss. <laughs> I'm right there. Mike and I.